uh, I've always had a passion for health and um, edu- and just education in general. And I find that those two things, if you're healthy and you have knowledge in your head, all the opportunities are available to you. And I think that a lot of the poverty that I've seen in my life, whether here domestically or abroad, um, has to do with one or both of those problems, right? Someone's homesick and so they can't, uh, you know, someone else has to stay home and take care of that person and that's lost income or lost education or both. Um, so we've really tried to focus on those two categories and in the most needed areas and delivering a results-oriented charity. Welcome to Men of Abundance, the podcast for those looking to level up their lives by hanging out with some of the greatest leaders and established professionals in our community, living a life of integrity, honor, and the abundance mentality. Prepare to pay it forward with your host, former army medic turned lifestyle entrepreneur, Wally Carmichael. What is going on, all of you amazing, abundant leaders out there? It is New Year's Eve. I am Wally Carmichael, your founder and host of the Men of Abundance podcast, the Pay It Forward community, proving to you that you can, in fact, live a life of abundance in family, faith, finances, and fitness on your way to having more. You don't have to wait for that perfect time. You don't have to wait for the kids to be out of the house or in school, or you don't have to wait for that next job or that next business deal. You don't have to wait for a darn thing. You can start living your life of abundance today. That's not to say that you're going to have everything you want in life today. And by everything, I mean not just resources, but relationships and connections and friends and experiences. All that stuff takes time. And you have to foster each and every one of those. But you can start your journey today. Now, before we get into this last episode of the year, technically second to the last, because right after this one, I'm going to be posting a bonus episode just for New Year's Eve to get your mind right for the new year. Now, if you know me at all, I'm not into New Year's resolutions, but what I am into because it's worked for me and my life and many others that I've been associated with, those that I've coached, those that have coached me, and just others that I've been communicating with over the years. And I will be sharing what that is in the New Year's Eve bonus episode. So make sure you subscribe and get access to that episode because it will, in fact, change the trajectory of the next year and of your life. I promise you especially if you have not already started implementing this one strategy in your life. Now, another strategy that I will share with you right now here today, and that is for you to give, to pay it forward. Be abundant in your actions today. Pay it forward. Pay forward your knowledge. Pay forward your times, treasures, and talents, and pay forward this podcast. Pay forward men of abundance to everyone you come in contact with. Share it on social media. Take a screenshot of your phone or wherever it is that you're listening to this episode on. Take a screenshot of photo and post it on social media. Post it on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, you name it, wherever you're at. Post it there and hashtag men of abundance, hashtag abundance. Even hashtag MOA while you're at it. And heck, if you feel really generous, hashtag Wally Carmichael. And no, not because I want to see my name in lights. I've seen that enough. I'm way past that. Only because I want other people to find what it is that we have going on over here so they too can be an abundant leader moving into 2020 and beyond. They can be right alongside you and I assure you, they will thank you for it. And one other way that you can pay it forward in a big way that just takes literally a couple minutes is to go over to iTunes and leave a rating and review. That really does push us up into the uh, stratosphere of the interwebs and all that good stuff and all their algorithms over there. It helps people find men of abundance when they're searching any of the key terms that are used in the show notes, in the episodes, and wherever else. And I really enjoy reading those reviews. Now, our future guest today is a pretty amazing guy. He is the CEO of Masia Development. His company assists men of abundance to make wise investments in high-end commercial real estate, the type of stuff that normally only the country's wealthiest families are able to get involved in. Boasting two master's degrees and a bachelor's degree in business administration, Mark has over 15 years of experience in domestic, foreign, residential, and commercial real estate 
and is currently an adjunct professor at NYU's Shack Institute of Real Estate. Men of Abundance, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Mark Massia. Mark, welcome to Men of Abundance, brother. How are you doing? Good. Thanks, Wally. Thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure, man. Where are you at in the world? Uh, we're in Phoenix, Arizona today. My hometown where I was born and raised. Oh, right. Awesome. <laughs> Left there when I was 20, joined the Army and said, I'm out of here, man, and traveled the world. Never looked back. Yeah. <laughs> Never looked back. In fact, <laughs> uh, my brother throughout the years was always, when are you coming back to home? When are you coming back home? Or when are you coming to live back home? I said, I'm never right. going back to live in Phoenix, man. I've been to too many other countries and too many other states to uh, go back to the same place. I don't know. It's nice. I just, um, the weather's better here in Florida and it's closer to big bodies of water and closer there to my, my, my wife's home town, which is Central America. Oh, yeah. Well, that makes total sense. And closer to Disney and Universal. <laughs> Hell, I can't play <laughs> Let's just be real yeah. about the whole bit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, fair enough. That's, I love it, man. Absolutely love it. But I do dig Phoenix. As a matter of fact, I'm taking a, we're taking a road trip. I'll be down there in July of all months. Oh, my goodness. But, oh, um, boy. Yeah. But it's going to be fun. It's because my son's heading out to Korea. So we're going to um, uh, take a road trip down there to take some stuff back uh, to his wife's home where she's from as well nice. and um and funny enough my oldest the son i'll be traveling with was born in panama in central america so okay. he's not really going home but <laughs> right right, kind of, right. right? yeah anyhow man i like to start out with an with an attitude of gratitude brother what do you have to be grateful for today yeah my uh sounds cliche but it's 100 percent true my friends and my family right now i'm feeling very loved and very supported and i'm very grateful uh, it means everything in the world, man. And it does, you know, I, I admit, it, it truly does sound cliche, especially talking with all the entrepreneurs and all the business owners and just all the high achievers that I talk to. Uh, those that are following, those that are high achievers think there's so much more to it. And it really is just basically that simple to have gratitude and, you know, love the basics, you know? Right. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things I like to do here on Men of Abundance is I talked a little bit about what you're doing, but that's your professional side. Here on Men of Abundance, we like to get to know the man behind the abundance. Mm -hmm. and so if you would, how would you describe yourself? Uh, I think generally cautiously optimistic. I think those are two uh, adjectives that I kind of live both sides every day. Mm -hmm. Explain that. What do you mean by that? Yeah. So, I mean, optimistic in the sense that you know, I, like you were saying, I think you can simplify things and focus on the core and it, it's pretty good 90% of the time or more, right? But there's, uh, you know, optimism can get you out over your skis and get you some dangerous situations. So you kind of need to be a little bit more thoughtful and, and cautious and kind of balance it out. Because I see a lot of friends of mine are like, I can do anything. I'll start a business with $1 and no experience. And I'm like, maybe, or maybe get a little bit of experience and a little bit of money and start it then. So that's kind of not right or wrong for everybody. But for me, that's the way I've always lived my life. It's, you know, being optimistic, believing yourself, doing all those positive things, but, you know, doing it in a little bit more of a realistic way, I would say. Well, yeah, I get what you're saying, man. And and the fact of the matter is you you could start a, a business with a dollar. Sure. Well, technically, uh, you know, it, if you're going to do it properly, you at least have to have the business license and you have to have, right. you know, your LLC and or have whatever entity you're going to put it into. But let's say it's a dollar, you know, let's say it's a $100. Uh, that doesn't mean to say that you're going to be successful right out the gate. Uh, in fact, right. chances or, are you're more probably like not. How many more years? Right? <laughs> exactly. It's like you'll be successful, but it could take you ten years to get where you would have if you had a thousand dollars in a year or something. I mean, I, that's exaggerated, but not in some cases, not too far off. Not at all. Not at all. Absolutely. You know, many businesses start and and shut down in a matter of months. Sometimes a matter right. of weeks if they're lucky. Well, I should say if they're unlucky, a matter of five years because they just struggled for just <laughs> struggled. way yeah, too exactly. long. Misery. Yeah. yeah. Before they changed direction or met yeah. somebody like me uh, yeah. and, and anybody else who can help out in that regard. And we're going to get into what you're doing because I dig what you're doing in the real estate space. It's extremely important, but I don't think I've ha actually had a conversation who's quite in the space that you're in. And I'm really intrigued by that. But even before we get into that, another one of the questions I like to ask here on Men of Abundance is that kick in the gut moment, because uh, especially with those in the real estate industry, looks like you've been in it for about 17 years. So the uh you know the it, usually when i'm talking about kicking the gut moment to a real estate professional uh 
2008, 2009 comes up, but not always. Some of them made it through it pretty darn good. But if you would, sure. rather it's business or personal, share with us a kick in the gut moment and really make us feel that. Yeah, you know, mine's kind of a business personal mix. Uh, so it's kind of getting hit on both sides at the same time. So my partner that I started the business with, who was also my best friend, still is my best friend to this day, um, decided he was leaving New York City and kind of leaving our business and moving with his family somewhere else. So there was a big personal disruption. This person that I had kind of relied on as, you know, my better half for lack of a better phrase, um, in the business world, at least it was leaving. And, you know, so I was no longer going to get personal involvement with him as much and no longer professional. And then at the same time, uh, sort of saw in my own personal life that it was not a once in a lifetime opportunity to kind of go try this relationship that with a woman that eventually became my wife. And so I also needed to leave New York city. So New York city was a place that I had always wanted to live my entire life and, you know, took me many, many years to get there and then many years to get entrenched in the, in the industry, in the area and leaving there, the thought of leaving there was something that never was going to happen in my world. Like it just wasn't a thing. And it became a thing at the same time that I was losing all this other important stuff in my life. So it was a really soul searching moment for me. Yeah, I can get that, especially if that's some place that you've been, you know, for a majority of your life, and it sounds like it has. So I'm guessing that's what got you to Phoenix. Yeah, well, actually, my wife, uh, not at the time she wasn't my wife, but we moved. To, she lived in upstate New York where she was finishing up her medical degree. So she was studying to be a doctor. Uh, and when I say upstate, some people think I mean an hour, but I mean like western far, you know, six hours from New York City, um, middle of nowhere, New York State, basically. And she, yeah, so from there we moved for her training and then eventually ended up here in Phoenix. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and for some people that really is, I mean, not even a consideration to yeah. relocate uh, within a state, let alone clear across the country right. uh, or even in some cases to another country for that matter. But you doing that, you know, is to me, I think it's just amazing that you would do that because so many people are just absolutely terrified of making that change when those that I know who have made such a drastic change, it really has been a better move for their, for their life. So ultimately, how's that been for you? Yeah, no, moving to Phoenix has been one of the best things. I mean, I love New York City. I love my friends, my family that are there, and I'll always have a special place in my heart. But, you know, for our lifestyle, for what we were looking for, and even for my business, it's been exponentially easier and better for us to be here than it had been or that I thought it would be even. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Well, congrats on that, man. That's freaking awesome. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Cause I mean, and, and would you have been able to do what it is that you're doing today? Had you stayed in New York or was that a deciding factor at all? I, I don't want to say no. Cause like you said in the beginning, challenging my $1 business assumption. Yeah. I mean, I definitely could have done it. I think it's just been a lot easier. And, and part of the challenge of the New York lifestyle in my mind is that like, it's a lot of people that are like, you know, if I can make it here, I can make it anywhere kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Where it's like, yeah, it's just harder. So just work harder. But at some point, and maybe I'm just getting older or maybe I just got smarter. I don't know. But like, I just, why, why make it harder just for making it harder? You don't achieve anymore. So like the same level of success here is the same level of success there, but it's way harder there. I can tell you from personal experience. And so I was like, I don't love working hard just for working hard. I like worked hard for the benefits. Yeah, I'll totally get that, man. It's it, We can go down so many rabbit holes on that one. But what do you think it is that made it harder and more difficult in New York? Not impossible, just a little bit more difficult than being in Phoenix. Yeah, I think it's that just the number, sheer number of people like – looking for the same types of opportunities and, and many cases having legs up that you don't have, you know, so there's a lot more uber wealthy, long real estate families there. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a lot of, you know, hundreds and hundreds of new, young, well-educated people that want to move there and they're trying to compete with you. So it's just kind of like international people. They just always felt like there was someone willing to do something you weren't, whether it was morally willing to sacrifice, whether it was using connections you didn't have, whether it was whatever. And again, I'm not saying it's not possible. Maybe I just wasn't mm -hmm. lucky enough or hardworking enough or whatever you want to say to, to do it. But I felt like once I got here, it was sort of like a breath of fresh air of just like competitive environment. And it's still yeah. super competitive. I'm not saying there's slouches here. It's definitely like a very sophisticated real estate market and business community, um, but just very different. 
Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, just thinking back, I've, I know quite a few very successful uh, people in the, that are real estate professionals in various degrees. I mean, Robert Kiyosaki's from Hawaii, but he lives in Phoenix. Right. Um, uh, goodness, I'm, I know another guy who sells raw land, buys and sells raw land, and yep. does an amazing job with that. He's in Phoenix. I know a lot yep. of guys that are very, very wealthy and doing very well with right. real estate. Yeah, we're a real estate area. town. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, yeah. the market's there still really good. Yeah, but you're doing something a little bit different. Talk a little bit about that and how you got into that. What are you doing? Yeah, so we started working with wealthy families, um, you know, hundred million kind of plus and up into the billion dollar category. Just by nature, it kind of fell into that. It wasn't like my goal, and we just made a good niche for ourselves, doing executing real estate transactions all over the country for them, and we built upon that to do a. Uh, kind of every person's version of that where we said, you know, after many years of building trust and, and executing great transactions for them said, look, we like doing this for you. It's exciting. It's profitable. It's all those positive things, but we, we want to do more. We want to expand the platform and, you know, showed them some benefits that they would achieve, talk through some of the negatives that they saw in terms of, you know, losing access to us or, you know, whittling down the amount of money they can put into each deal or whatever the risks they were worried about, uh, uh, you know, anonymity was one of them. Um, but saying we can do this on a basically public level without doing all the full crazy public options. So what we were able to do was go through the new crowdfunding regulations and essentially do a mini IPO. And, and now our investments are available to everyone um, at every level. And we don't really differentiate um in terms of economics, at least, between people who send us, you know, a thousand dollars and people who send us a hundred million dollars. So is it kind of like a? Let me just try to understand this a little bit better because I was in, um, involved in working with some guys many years ago who would go and buy, say, apartment complexes. I know you're doing more. Um, uh, what do you call it? Um, Retail re strip centers. Yeah, and yeah, strip, office, exactly, yeah. exactly. But this was this particular um, program was. Uh, they were buying apartment complexes that had very low occupancy rate, and they right. were renovating it. They were putting in new bylaws, putting in new management, the whole bit, and they were just getting it like up to 70, 80, even 90% occupancy rate. And then they were bringing on real estate you know, kind of investors. Anybody could invest into this, depending on yep. how much you put in, how much you're getting out of it. And then we go do it again and again and again. Is it similar to that? It is, and, but we bring them in kind of early, and our our value add is much longer. Mm -hmm. So we're not buying centers that are you know fifty percent vacant or some crazy thing. We're buying centers that are great locations, great great properties, and great markets that have some long term value add. So they may have a long term lease with a tenant that's well below market, or have kind of some long term capital improvements that need to be done. Because the the whole point of the way that we do stuff, especially if you're having that family office backing, is it's it's much larger long focus. We're not saying investing for the one to two to years. Cycle. We're investing for 10 years or longer. Mm -hmm. And so that requires these kind of properties that are good already in some respects, because if, if they weren't good, it means they're probably not in a great location. And we are banking on a 10 year or longer investment strategy, you know, real estate location, location, location. It's, it's as cheesy as it is true. It's, mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. And then from what I saw, you're putting in this commercial. So you're putting in like dental offices and these are long term leasers into these. Exactly. Buildings. Yep. Yeah, so they're sticking around for a while. Now, are you going into new developments or are you just taking um, and renovating new, older ones? We do. So we're opportunistic we, wherever the uh, value of the opportunity is. And so right now we've kind of done less in the multifamily space, although historically we've done a lot of apartments in multifamily. Uh, right now we think there's a lot more value in retail and medical office just because mm -hmm. a lot of people are feeling less positive about that. So there's more opportunity there for us to run. Um, but over time, whether it's development, whether it's value add, it's it's always going to be case by case or in some cases both. Like we'll find a property that has extra land and we'll develop it. Um, we have that skill set and so we certainly want to utilize that. It's not the core of what we do necessarily. Uh, we like to have a mix of both um, because the development deals just take so long and are so kind of 
bang your head against the wall with a lot of mm-hmm. municipalities. So I need a little bit of a shorter term win there for both our investors and for my own mental well-being. But uh, yeah, we, we do both. I dig that. I love that. You know, I was looking at one of the projects that's on your site, and it has the uh, Aspen Dental, and then on the other side, the iLab. Uh, what is it? iLab. And yep. um, here in Florida, I live in an area where that's really developing, and a lot of these strip mall type um, buildings are going up all over the place. And it seems like every other corner is a dental clinic, a new dental clinic, a Dunkin' Donuts. And then another dental clinic and maybe uh, maybe a coffee shop. Another, t- It's just crazy. I mean, yeah. I'm wondering how these guys make – literally, there's a dental office across the street from a dental office. It's just <laughs> both of them are getting ready to open here uh, real shortly. I'm like, sure. how in the world do these guys stay in business? But they do pretty right. good, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's the funny thing is a lot of these companies have amazing real estate departments in house that do demographic studies mm-hmm. and things that are way beyond like next level kind of stuff. So I don't know which groups, but a lot of them they, uh, you know, I don't know which groups are in your neighborhood, but mm-hmm. a lot of them they do a lot of research and they, you know, it, yeah. it just shows like we're we're living longer, we're spending more on healthcare. That's definitely part of the story there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and the other thing to answer my own question is, in when it comes to retail, you'll see like in certain strip malls or whatever, you'll see multiple jewelry stores, and you want to put like-minded or like yes. items in the yeah. same area because I don't want to go clear across town to one jewelry <laughs> store yeah. shop and then right. clear across town, but they're all in one spot. Hey, Just like the car dealers. Yeah, yeah we're all, yeah. exactly. We're all helping each other out uh, in a six sort of way. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yeah, the agglomeration, yeah. I think, in the economics is the principle. Yeah, totally, totally. Absolutely. A lot of people yeah. don't get that, but I, I get that, and I answer my own question on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, um, you know, you know, one of the questions I ask is how you're paying it forward. But one of the things that I do want to bring up that I did notice is that you have started your own charity called in- Invenium. Is that how yep. you pronounce it? Invenium Incorporated? What is that yep. exactly? Let's talk about that. Yeah, so uh, I've always had a passion for health and um, edu- and just education in general. And I find that those two things, if you're healthy and you have knowledge in your head, all the opportunities are available to you. And I think that a lot of the poverty that I've seen in my life, whether here domestically or abroad, um, has to do with one or both of those problems, right? Someone's homesick and so they can't, uh, you know, someone else has to stay home and take care of that person and that's lost income or lost education or both. Um, so we've really tried to focus on those two categories and in the most needed areas and delivering a results oriented charity because of the entrepreneurial background that I have, you know, I got frustrated with a lot of the charities that a lot of them do really good. I'm not trying to disparage anything, but you know, I was just more like, what are the results? What are the results? What are the results? And it was always this intangible, almost like PR. It's like, well, you do it because it helps. And it's like, well, how does it help? And they're like, well, we can't tell you. And I'm like, that doesn't work for my brain. That's not how I'm Mm -hmm. wired. Mm -hmm. So we started this, um, and it was really grown out of that frustration. And we're, you know, I teach at NYU and that's always been one of my ways of giving back. Um, and this was kind of another way to add on to that. So take that passion for teaching and interest in teaching, giving back and do it at a broader scale. Um, so it's, you know, it's still relatively small. I still have full time other job and and only a few team members there supporting me. But it's been it's been interesting and a learning experience and super fun and, and rewarding and you know happy to do it. Yeah, I totally get that. And I get the education side. How? Where does the medical side come in? Yeah, so my dad's a doctor. My wife's a doctor. Uh, my uncle's a doctor. We invest a ton in medical office. So a lot of our investors are doctors. So we have kind of a pretty large network of – my mom was a nurse, actually. I forgot to mention. Um, and we have a lot of medical professionals, you know, kind of around us at all the time. And I – you know, one time wanted to be a doctor until I realized that school was not for me for a lifetime of learning before I get to actually do a job. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, I've always had a passion for it and interest in it um, and saw that as another avenue where a lot of things are kind of not systemically being done there. You know, parachute in, solve a specific problem, leave, don't support the system. And then they kind of fall by the wayside in those communities where they don't have the infrastructure to support it. And when I was in India with my wife, who's an eye doctor, she was there doing surgery at one of the, one of the cities there. And they were talking about how they were building out these networks within the smaller communities so that not everybody had to come to these big cities. And it's kind of an unsustainable thing. You know, people were sleeping on the street just to wait for their appointment because they came from, you know, many villages away. And so they were talking about how to put that into the community and support it around that. So we're focused on the same kind of thing, taking smaller, you know, 
um, target areas and implement a systemic system, something that's self-supporting as opposed to kind of the parachute in, solve a specific problem for a short period of time and then leave and hope it continues, which it usually doesn't. Oh, absolutely not. I was a medic in the Army for 25 years, and one of the things we used to do when I was in Panama in Central America, South America, is we would go out, like, literally in the jungle and set up in a a school or, you know, wherever – and have all these medical doctors and dentists and you name it and for dentists for instance rather than try to fix a tooth they would just pull it because there's not they could fix it but then it'd have to be follow-on care exactly and you're not getting that because like you said literally you'd, you'd we'd get there there'd be nobody for miles that we knew yeah. of you wake up the next morning there's like goodness 200 300 people outside (laughs) and they got everything from you know bad teeth to machete wounds it's you know just cutting through the jungle and stuff it's really crazy and to sustain that is extremely difficult uh if not really impossible i had to use that word but um they just don't have the infrastructure for it in some of these villages and and stuff so then they have to travel and everything so kudos to you man that's awesome that you're doing that because there's a huge need for it and there's just I was just, you know, so much more that people could do. And I dig the fact that you just weren't happy with what was going on in the first place. And and it came out of frustration because I find that a <laughs> lot of people do amazing things just simply out of frustration, either for something that they see going on or something that's touching somebody personally in their family. Right. Yep. Yeah, that's really cool. So we are at the point of the conversation where we are going to pay it forward to our abundant leaders. Ready to do that? Sure. Yep. Excellent. So share one to three actionable steps that men of abundance can take today. Yes. So I think um, always be learning is kind of what originally came to my head. And that's, I'm, as I mentioned, a passion for education, but also a passion for learning, uh, not just educating others. And I think, you know, podcasts like this, or uh, reading books or listening to things, uh, you know, there's a reason why, well, one, my podcasts are so popular with with the higher income and higher succeed, higher achiever type people. And also why you almost always hear somebody say like, well, what's your favorite book or what's a good book you're reading lately? And there's always an answer, right? Because that's what it takes to kind of get to the next level. What got you here isn't going to mm-hmm. get you to where you want to go. So I think actionable is, you know, pick up a podcast or, or continue to listen to a podcast and do it more religiously. Um, listen to or read uh, a book. I, I listen to a lot of audible books on my drive. So that's similar to reading. Um, those are, those are the kind of first things. Um, and then if there's a specific skill set, like, you know, real estate or whatever it is, I mean, I'm biased to real estate, but whatever it is, it, take a class, take something, some action step towards learning that because I think education to me is the key to everything. I mean, obviously, I just talked about my charity that's education focused. I teach. So again, I'm biased, but I did get two master's degrees and I think it totally helped me uh, in more ways than I can imagine. Um, and then I think, you know, the, the counterpoint to that or the other thing that I got out of all those things is investing in your relationships. Um, from my master's degrees, I didn't just get the certification on my wall that says I know stuff or the knowledge in my head from the class I sat in, but I met some amazing people and many of my compatriots didn't keep in touch with those amazing people. They just kind of were like, yeah, there were people I knew and now I don't know them anymore. And that was such a waste to me because you don't often meet that many great, smart, you know, highly motivated type people. And so what I've been focused on is building those relationships and the best actionable steps I can say for that is, you know, refer business someone out of the blue for no reason. They didn't ask you just something nice to somebody if you can, um, or a new contact if it's not direct business. Um, and then, you know, fam- friends and family I mentioned at the outset, I think, you know, t- call them and tell them that you appreciate them just again, for no reason, not their birthday, not whatever, just kind of investing in those relationships. Oh, wow. I absolutely love it, man. And I heard connections and contacts and connections and contacts. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Just extremely important to your path on success and your path on to uh, living a life of abundance, because it really is about the relationships and the connections and the people in your life uh, that if you just kind of look past them, you know, you you never know what somebody can do for you until you actually sit down and have a conversation with them or you can do for them even right. more important. 
Yep. And I think that's exactly like you said, a two way street and, mm -hmm. and just for no reason. I mean, a lot of people, I think, focus on like, what can I do to get this thing or how, whatever. Mm -hmm. I think it's more just like you feel good about yourself when you do stuff for other people. I mean, you know yeah. this. Yeah, absolutely, man. I'm very well. What are the rituals that make the biggest impact in your life? Uh, I think running or and some type of exercise. Without that, I've kind of always been lost. I, I don't for a long time in my life, I didn't focus on it as being so important, uh, meaning I didn't see it, but now I do. Um, reading, educating, obviously, I'm a broken record to some extent with mm -hmm. that. I, I follow, practice it's what important. I preach, I read every day. Um, and then the relationship that's the first and foremost in my life is my wife, so I share kind of everything with her. There's no kind of barriers, nothing we don't talk about. I talk with her every single day about everything that's going on with me from you know the most important to the most mundane in my business and vice versa so that we have that deep connection and I have a real partner in life. Absolutely. So you mentioned several times reading or listening. What are you reading or listening to that you'd recommend to our abundant leaders and why? Yeah, I just finished Traction um, by Gino Wickman, which I really it it's similar to Principles, which I also recently read by Ray Dalio. Those two books kind of really changed uh, in a big way to think about scaling the business and kind of making it less oriented around me. So those have changed me fundamentally as where I am in my business. And after doing this for over a decade, you'd think a lot of these principles would be ingrained. And some of them are, but kind of honing that down to like a very specific, uh, repeatable action steps. That's what those books are kind of really all about. And that's what I love. I mean, that's kind of like your podcast It's trying to figure out like what builds abundance and let's just do those things. I think that's a great mentality and it makes total sense. And it is repeatable if you follow certain, you know, prescribed mechanisms. All right. But like you said, what got you to where you are today is not going to be what gets you to yep. your next level. Uh, where you want to go. So it's important to learn new skills, new new techniques, and just new mindsets. Yeah. Absolutely, and keep honing on that. So what do you feel holds most people back from living a life of true abundance, Mark? Yeah, I think it's the one of two sides of the fear, fear of failure or fear of not being worthy. And I know this from personal experience. I mean, I think whenever I've hit that kind of ceiling and, and I'm not able to break to, to the next step as easily, it's almost always one of those two, right? I'm either afraid that I'm going to fail if I do it or, or do something big, or I'm afraid that I just don't deserve it, right? I don't deserve the next level of success or something like that. Um, so speaking from experience there, that's that's what I think. Yeah, not uncommon. Absolutely not. So what does being a man of abundance mean to you? Yeah, I think it's financial peace is a big part of that. So mm -hmm. I'm, not, you know, I haven't heard, I've talked a ton about financial, but I think, uh, you know, having experienced financial stress and anybody else who has, it's really hard to feel abundant when you're, you know, scrounging for meals or whatever it is. And luckily, I've never had that level of challenge. But, you know, just anytime you have a level of stress in finances, it's very difficult to have a balanced life. And I think to me, that doesn't mean like having a billion dollars and doing whatever you want kind of thing. I think it's more of a balanced income, balanced, reasonable expenses kind of lifestyle. Um, and then secondly, maximizing relationships. Again, I, I mentioned that a ton, both personally and professionally, you know, uh, to me personally, it's more important to have, you know, a handful of great friends than it is or, or business um, associates than it is to have a hundred sort of tangential like people I barely know. Um, so I think maximizing those relationships and then giving back to helping others that are less fortunate. I think that's makes you feel more holistic and it doesn't have to be anything huge. It could be, you know, helping your kid. It could be doing something, volunteering around your town. I think just something that gets you outside of your self and that selfish mentality is, is what it's all about. And you totally get it, Mark. That's, that's the recipe right there. Listen, guys, go back, re rewind this and go back and listen to that again, because absolutely. And one of the things about financial peace is, um, I don't know what it specifically means to you because it is different for everybody. Mm -hmm. But, in, you know, a while back, it's different for me even now than it was oh, four, sure. four years ago because four years ago yep. I just wanted to be able to, you know, buy new tires for my truck if, if I <laughs> right. needed them, you know, and not have to put them on credit. And now yeah. I can just – I need new tires for one of the vehicles. Psh, go get new tires. No yeah, big deal. Yeah. And I don't have to do right. like my dad did and go buy retreads and then – Three months later, go buy another set of retreads, <laughs> you know, and yep. have, it's just it's the simple little things to be able to do, uh, Definitely. you know, and that's a different level for everybody. 
But just of course, no, hundred percent. I think it's the balance. That's what I was yeah. referring to. Yeah, everybody has their own level and has to mm-hmm. decide what's right for them. But the balance of not, you know, living exponentially beyond your means, like you're saying, where it's like, don't put everything on credit card. Don't have like mm-hmm. a, you know, ten million dollar mortgage if you can't afford it. You know. Well, the other thing is, is it's important for guys, and I really harp on this a lot because, you know, so many people just come out and they're making, you know, sixty thousand dollars a year, seventy thousand mm-hmm. dollars a year, and they're like, well, I want to be a millionaire by the end of the year. Well, why? And we, I mm. drill down to the whole why, 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 why. And the right. bottom line is this. You just want financial freedom, brother. That's yeah. all you really want. It's not, it does not take a million dollars to have. <laughs> right. I am not a millionaire. And I tell right. you right now, I have financial freedom. Yeah. And I'm very happy and very, very, uh, no, I'm not content. I'm still growing. Sure. You know, yeah. I'm still improving my foxhole, as I like to say. But yep. um, I'm, I'm, I wasn't at 70,000 reaching for, well, there was a time in my life I was doing that. And it was killing me. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> That's right. where I'm more yeah. at today, doing this. Yep. Awesome, brother. That's great. So, man, it has been absolutely amazing, uh, this conversation. We finally got connected, and I'm glad we did. Yeah, and appreciate um, it. Your, your website, Masia, is it MasiaDEV.com? Yep. That's right. We Masia also have property income, yeah. if it's easier for some listeners. Perfect. So we'll have that linked up in the show notes, guys. Don't worry about it. Writing that down, I'll have it linked up in the show notes. But Mark, is there any other way that you would like for our guys to get a hold of you? And what else do we not talk about that you want to ensure that our abundant leaders get out of our conversation today? Um, yeah, well, free free to email me if it's easy or for your guests. I'm happy to share anything um, in any way that I can help. That's definitely my my mission in life. So mark at propertyincome.com is the easiest over audio uh, email address that I have. Um, as far as anything else, no, I mean, I think Wally, it's a, it's a great show and I really appreciate you having me. Yeah, absolutely, man. My pleasure. And uh, brother, just go out, live your life of abundance and keep paying it forward, man. It's making a huge difference. And I really appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. All right, Abundant Leaders. So your action step for today is to ensure that you subscribe to Men of Abundance, share it with everyone you come in contact with, and look out for the bonus episode coming out today. If it's not out already, go look for it. Go check it out. That one episode is going to change the trajectory of your year and set you on the right path. I believe it because it's what I've done with my life for several years and many others have taught me the same thing and those I've followed and those I've shared this with, it has done the same for them. I wish you the best. I hope you have an amazing new year. Please be safe out there and just share with me all the amazing things you have going on on social media and wherever else that we are connected. Now, go out. Live your life of abundance. And guys, make sure to pay it forward. That's all for today, Abundance Leaders. For more about our guests and the powerful information we shared with you today, be sure to sign up for our mailing list at menofabundance.com. We appreciate your time and look forward to hanging out with you on our next episode. So until then, be sure to pay it forward and live your life of abundance.